We're here at Peter Collins Soccer Park in Plainview, New York, the heart of Long Island Junior Soccer League, to present you with this brief video to parents and players of Eastern New York Youth Soccer Association. Eastern New York Youth Soccer Association is one of the oldest and largest soccer organizations in America. And it also is a nonprofit soccer organization, which is critically important for you as parents to know so that you realize that everything that Eastern New York Youth Soccer Association does is not for a profit motive, but rather to help you have the best opportunities for your children to play soccer here in New York, from Montauk Point all the way to the Canadian border. We're here to present you with some information that we think is important for you to know as a parent of a soccer player here in New York. We're going to have interviews with some of the most well-known alumni from Eastern New York Youth Soccer Association and from some of the most successful soccer programs in America. When it was time for the United States women's national team to celebrate their World Cup victory, they came to New York City's Canyon of Heroes, in the heart of Eastern New York territory. In addition, Eastern New York is home to three professional soccer franchises, the New York Cosmos, the New York Red Bulls, and NYCFC, making Eastern New York the envy of soccer fans all across America. Eastern New York Youth Soccer Association, or Eastern New York, is home to the oldest soccer league in America, the Cosmopolitan Youth Soccer League, and one of the largest, the Long Island Junior Soccer League. It was established as a nonprofit organization in 1972 to serve as a state association reporting to U.S. soccer. And while it may be almost 50, Eastern New York utilizes sports sign-up, social media, and the most modern technology to help our leagues run efficiently and effectively. Eastern New York serves over 100,000 youth players up to 19 years old, over 25,000 coaches, and volunteers with over 400 clubs. From Montauk Point, Long Island, to the Canadian border and east of Route 81. And there are 11 leagues that make up Eastern New York. Long Island Junior Soccer League, Metro Kids, Big Apple Youth Soccer, Cosmopolitan Youth Soccer League, Staten Island Soccer League, Westchester Youth Soccer District, East Hudson Youth Soccer League, Hudson Valley Youth Soccer League, Capital District Youth Soccer League, Mid-State Soccer League, and Central New York Soccer League. Eastern New York is affiliated with USYS and reports directly to US Soccer, which is a member of the CONCACAF region or Confederation which there are only six confederations in the world, and they all report to FIFA, the governing body of soccer all over the world. Eastern New York provides a variety of programs for all youth soccer players in New York. They say you can't be all things to all people. Well, don't tell Eastern New York that, because they have been serving the diverse needs of the youth soccer movement for almost 50 years. Here are some of their programs and benefits. U.S. Youth Soccer ENY Championship Cup, Arch Capital Group Cup, President's Cup, Premier League, ODP Olympic Development Program, Coles Cup, Top Soccer, Coaching Education, Trainer Standards, Risk Management, Annual Awards, Grants, and Scholarships, Hall of Fame, Referees, and Soccer Across America, just to name a few. Eastern New York works with leading edge technology to provide you, the parents, coaches, and players of Eastern New York with the best and most efficient services. To find out more about Eastern New York youth soccer, go to our website at www.enysoccer.com or call us at 888-536-9972 or email us at enyoffice at enysoccer.com. Se habla espanol. So what is important in this process is being aware of something that I call the creep effect, where the child begins playing soccer for the love of the game. 
and the parent begins taking the child to enjoy watching the child play and then creeping into that if they show any success at an early age is the possible concept of a college scholarship and therein lies the problem so the first piece becomes the parent thinks more is better if one team is good two teams are better if one training session is good five training sessions are better and the child whether the parent wants to believe it or not starts picking up on these clues of behavior that parents are exhibiting that they have a goal to reach which is to get a college scholarship and the players are generally very honest about their own ability and they can self-assess where they are and where their friends are very easily so the two aspects that are critical here are the player might not love soccer as much as the parent does and might not want that same goal or the player might recognize I'm good but I'm not as good as these five people playing with me and so I just want to keep loving and enjoying the game but the subtle pressures of the parents who are well-meaning they're trying to do more for their children which is wonderful we all want to do more for our children so they're trying to do more and sometimes the end result of that is the young player actually quitting because they can't succeed at the level that they perceive their parents want them to succeed at. I've been with Red Bull now eight years as the Academy Director. Uh, we've been recognized on several occasions as the number one academy in the country. Um, I don't know how valid that is. I think we are clearly in the in the top five of the MLS academies. Um, we have a lot of talented players. We have a lot of hardworking players. And that culture is something that we really think is important. Um, talent is not enough. It's got to be about work ethic. And it's got to be about surrounding yourself with good people. And by that I mean it's just the, the friends you hang out with, but most important are the people you spend most of your time with, and that's your parents. Having good parents that can lead and guide and support the player and not push them or distract them or, or make uh, or, or, or putting unrealistic expectations is so important. And all the successful players that I've seen have been self-motivated and have had a great support network behind them. Everywhere I've been, whether it's been working with Olympic Development, uh, program in Region 1, working with the U14 national team. One of the things we always, I always talk about, and my mentor always reinforced, Matty Shellshade said, we're looking for good people and good players. And developing character and finding good characters is, is essential in putting a team together. Many times I'm asked uh, by the parents of young players, what is the pathway to be a pro? What is the pathway to make it to the World Cup or Champions League? Um, it does start certainly with uh, a, a certain amount of inborn talent is necessary. Um, and then they need to spend a lot of time on uh, acquiring skill. And working with the ball is so vital at young ages. And, and parents just being supportive, whether it's going out in the back and kicking around with you, them or dropping them off at a school and having them kick off the wall or putting a tether ball up in the backyard, being positive, being encouraging, not worrying about winning, not worrying about playing for the club next next in the next town because they've won more championships or not because at 14 they think some college coaches are scouting them. They don't. That's unrealistic. And a good uh, nurturing family and, and surrounding them with good people and motivating them that way to be the best they can be, that's the best that the parent can do in terms of support. Um, I, we've had some unfortunate scenarios uh, that I've seen uh, in ODP, in with Red Bull, where we have parents that micromanage, that push kids, and it's got to come from within. The player has to want to be good. He has to want to go. Not, he's not performing. They can't live their lives through their children. They have to let them uh, grow and learn and experience and challenge themselves when they're ready.
Tactical right. ability means your ability to be comfortable on the ball. So your ability to receive a ball, to pass a ball, and sometimes dribble a ball, and to be able to do it in a well-balanced way where you can move to your left and you can move to your right, and that you can do it you know, really proficiently and efficiently, and that's something that's really emphasized, so that you can really, you know, really master the skills that the, the game demands. So, you know, as they get older and, you know, good players like a Michael Bradley was a very small player growing up and his whole game was built on technique and then being tactically aware. And, you know, Michael grew very late. Like, he was very, very small. But, you know, basically his foundation to have a passion for the game and to have great technical ability and, and a good tactical sense to him was it allowed him to become a professional. If you look at players from way back when, John Harks and Tab Ramos were very similar. They were, they were very small when they were growing up, but technically very, very good players. And then tactically they learned because they had a great passion for the game. So building up your technical abilities as well as having a passion to do it. And, you know, I think, you know, we talk about coaches. As coaches, we want to inspire kids. So can we motivate them? Can we challenge them? Can we inspire them to have fun and to enjoy it and to want to get better at things? And so when you find coaches that are able to do that, that's, that's really important to your development because hopefully they're going to lead you down the right paths and it's going to, going to move you forward. I think U.S. soccer has taken a good path into, you know, you know, reducing the number of kids on a field and, and making the game smaller so the kids will get more touches and the emphasis on our technical ability hopefully will, will, will happen through that. But I think that's the most important thing and I think you know, just exposing them to be, uh, you know, to not worry about the winning and losing, but just find a, a good club that's working on their development and that they're, you know, inspiring them. I think that's the most important thing. Accountability is a big part of it. You know, a desire to want to prove yourself. And I think, um, you know, good players and great players always have a desire to improve themselves. They have a thirst for knowledge. They want to learn. They stay open-minded and they have a desire to want to prove to their coach and their teammates that they can do what's being asked of them. So if we're talking about crossing a ball with your left foot or we're talking about getting into the back post and scoring ahead, you're talking about closing down an opposition in midfield, all great players take on that competitive challenge to want to be the best at whatever's being outlined for them. And they tend not to make excuses and they tend to be honest with themselves and, you know, all those players, you know, fall, fell short in some areas, right? Technically and tactically, you know, talking about Connor, Tim, and, and, and Chris. But they had the desire and the willingness to keep working and to keep pushing themselves. And um, that's really something that's missing in youth sports today is this really character development and value-oriented development and getting better and having to prove yourself to your coach and your teammates on a regular basis. And, you know, sometimes everybody wants to be the top goal scorer, but the top goal scorer usually is so happy because they're the top goal scorer, they don't want to learn anything else and generally don't become good players. And so really the, the best thing is to be able to be this overall player who wants to fit into the team and really understand the game and what the game demands are. And as you grow older and older, the game demands become more and more. You know, finding that right environment and, and trying to hopefully, and, and look, all our kids, if, they, if our kids are meeting all the expectations, then they're not in the right environment. So our kids certainly should be falling short somewhere. And that our kids need to learn that, you know what, that, hey, look, I gotta work to improve upon that. That doesn't come. So everybody needs to be improving. So to say that I've got the greatest under 12, under 13, under 14 team, it may be true, your team's unbelievable, but I can guarantee each child needs to improve in different areas and in different aspects and to understand that. And that, that thought process on its own will be instrumental in your child's development both on the field and then off the field. Because being able to accept feedback, being able to accept falling short, being able to accept uh, you know, not being perfect all the time hopefully gives them that determination, drive, and willingness to stay in the game and keep continuing to battle, whether that's in school, whether that's in a job, whether that's in life, whether that's through personal situations that they're going to face. Those are the important components, and that's the character, 
values and process that we try to we talk a lot about here at St. John's because it, it really kind of is life lessons that get taught on an everyday basis through sport. The one, there are certain programs that are good and certain programs that are not. D2, there are certain programs that are good and certain programs that are not. And D3, there are certain programs that are high level and certain programs that are not. You look at a Williams College, Division III, they're probably better than 65, 70% of the Division I programs. Um, you look at a Southern Connecticut with Coach Lang at Division II, they're probably better than 60, 65% of the Division I programs. So it's not the level as far as, you know, uh, each individual program has its strengths and weaknesses, the level doesn't define it. The difference with the levels is you get more exposure at Division I because of the, uh, because of the perception, but doesn't mean the best players are always there. Yeah, we have 9.9 .9 for our whole program. So at any one time, over the course of a four-year period, there's nine, almost 10 players, or the equivalency of 10 players receiving scholarships. Halves, fulls, quarters. But obviously when you're putting together a team of 34 players, 30 players, you know, there's a lot of very good players who do not get athletic aid because it's not available. As far as foreign and American, because so many American families hold you up for full scholarships and maybe their son is not quite a full scholarship player, we often go with the foreign player who we know is worth the full scholarship rather than the American player because the parents are somewhat inflexible in their demands and their expectations. Well, first off, parents shouldn't be concerned about that. If the kid is worth the scholarship, he'll be identified or she'll be identified. And if the player is not, it'll be the same. You know, but you start to get a handle on kids when they're 15, 16, on the male side, when they're 15, 16 years of age. But really, the parents are out of the equation, frankly, because the parent's opinion on whether the player is a scholarship or player or not is irrelevant because the parent is not awarding the scholarship. Stay out of their life. Let them play. Let them develop. Don't live vicariously through your kids. Let your kids make these choices and decisions how much they want to play and let them follow their own path. I grew up in Brentwood uh, in Long Island. Um, at that time, it's far different from what it is now. It's just a, it was a smaller club, but uh, I learned some valuable lessons uh, on those uh, soccer fields in Brentwood, um, where now they've transformed into a beautiful soccer complex. It was dirt fields, and, and uh, that's where it, we, got, we got our feet and hands dirty. But um, for me, it was Brentwood most of my youth career, um, and at that time, we had Long Island Select, and State Select, and Regional, and National uh, teams. Um, that was the, the next step for us. Um, again, you know, s some similar things these days, but there's so much more out there now for kids. But, um, yeah, so St. Anthony's was my high school. Um, so it was Brentwood, St. Anthony's, mixed in with uh, the, 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 the next level stuff, Long Island Select, State Select, um, and then Adelphi University was where I went to, went to college. What Long Island Select and State Select did for me was was exposed me to good training sessions, which was better players and usually better coaching. So the formula for, for, for you know, where players can improve is, is to surround them with better players, where things are just tougher, time and space is limited, things are moving faster, and then, you know, can you get the, a coach around those good players that are giving good messages every, every time? So, uh, you know, so if, if, if club ball was here, slash high school ball and, and college was here, you know, it was that in-between where it just 
helped you, uh, challenge you to faster, you know, faster and, and higher quality soccer. So once uh, I was in college, you know, in my mind at least now, I think I've made it, you know, playing at that highest level. Um, for me, there was no professional league. And the timing ended up being right, where Major League Soccer started in 1996. I graduated from college in 1994. For two years, I played for the Long Island Rough Riders, which again, at that time, was the, that next opportunity or next level for me. Um, I got signed to a contract, played locally. And uh, you know, the good thing, I think, uh, from college to that semi-pro soccer, or that professional soccer, it wasn't a huge jump. It was, again, instead of 1,000 people or 500 people I'm playing in front of, now it's 5,000 or 3,000. But now you're playing with Tony Miola and, and Jimmy Rooney, and so again the bar is getting pushed. Um, you know, Paul Paul Riley, Declan McSheffrey, these guys, these guys are men. Uh, you know, and, and now I'm trying to survive at, at that level, and and th that ended up preparing me well for Major League Soccer. Um, so and now you're going to see, can I survive there? So it was always a challenge, and then ultimately it was the national team. It's the greatest honor and the highest level. Um, and uh, look, I mean, it was something I, I had a privilege to be part of. Um, and, and again, now you're being pushed even more. The speed of play, the demands, the, the pace of these games. You have to think faster, you have to run harder. Um, the concentration levels, uh, the, the World Cup qualifiers, what's at stake in these games. Um, you know, so you get pushed and you see, you know, how good can, can you be? So. Yeah, look, I mean, I think college prepares you for those moments. Uh, professional soccer prepares you for the national team. But for me, it was a lot of the lessons I learned when I was a kid and, and from my family, um, you know, because the, the focus and, and the things that I valued, that my mom and dad valued, the hard work, the dedication, uh, just never giving up, being a team player, those are the things that I think swayed it for me in the long run. Of course, I think I had a gift to play soccer, but in, in the end, there was so many players that could play soccer. So you're looking for those little, maybe intangibles, or tangibles, this is maybe the things that uh, maybe are hard to measure sometimes, what's in your heart or your character. So for me, that always opened the doors for me. And I think at the highest level, even today, separates me a little bit from the next guy. My advice to a parent at club level is, uh, you know, and, and to my own 14 and 11 year old, and I just try to get them in a good soccer situation. And good meaning, kind of look at it. Is there good players that they're playing with? Are they having fun? Do they have a coach that's kind of looking after them, mentoring, t teaching those little lessons I spoke about before, um, giving them good soccer messages, you know, maybe trying to have in the right balance of, of soccer and fun and, and you know, that, that it's, it's, you know, is it an art or a science? I think it's both. You, know, you have to have a good feel. These situations I don't see all the time, you know, the healthy, pure soccer situation. So one, can, as the parent, I'd always ask a kid, are you having fun? Above all, are you having fun? Because if, if they're not having fun, they're not going to learn. They're not going to like going there. It's, it's, it's a lot of commitment for not have to have fun playing soccer, where most, of, most are not going to become pros. Most are not getting full rides. You know, so when it's all said and done, don't you want your kid to just have fun and have great memories and experiences from soccer? Learn soccer, learn some good lessons off the field too, on the field. Um, the ones that helped me get to the top, let's say. Um, you know, so that's, that's one part of it. Uh, now the college process, you know, for me, I just want my, my son, both of my kids, to end up at a, at a university where they can learn something in the classroom, take some specialty when they when they graduate, they have something unique where they can you know find a, a good job. But now you're trying to balance soccer and school. What is the right fit again academically first and foremost? And now soccer wise, it's tricky. Sometimes you got to go where the money is, right? Sometimes, you know, but if but if all is equal, you know, can I get my son? Like I said, it's not new, in the right soccer environment. How does the team play? How are those players? Do I fit? Is that below me? Is it above me? Is it perfect? Does it feel right? You know, and, and unfortunately, the, the bar is getting pushed younger and younger. Freshmen and sophomore in high school trying to figure out where they're going to go for college, it's, again, stressful. So imagine a, 
a 14-year-old now figuring out, getting that, those types of questions and pressures. It's a lot. So as a parent, I think we've got to facilitate the process, try to guide them, urge them along because they're a little lazy sometimes. But um, certainly, in the end, you just want your kid to be happy. At least that's what I have seen out there. It's what I feel. You want to be happy. Happy with school, happy socially, happy with soccer. Um, so can we, as the parents, just try to facilitate, ask questions. Don't push too hard, but push hard enough because they need that. Um, and keep asking your, your son or your daughter, you know, what, what's going to make you happy? Can you maybe, we're, you know, usually we're smarter than them. We've been there, you know. Can, we, we know the questions to ask and how to prod a little bit. Um, we know what's important for them. So can we keep asking the right questions, be in communication, and don't be afraid to ask uh, people who have gone through it before, parents and, and even kids who are in college already. They're the ones who, who know. Um, so yeah, that's, there's plenty of, of resources out there, but uh, my biggest thing is, is try to keep it simple, ask questions, and try to find that right fit. Um, and then that's going to lead to the happiness and success. I started out in North Babylon and then we ended up going over to Deer Park uh, and then I finished up in high school with uh, Colmac United. In 96, which was my freshman year, we won the States and then again in 98, my junior year. It wasn't a tough choice, I would say, but definitely uh, something that my parents always really pushed with me and my sister was, was school and making sure that we, we did well uh, with, our, with our grades and, and um, right from when we were young all the way up and through till college. And uh, my sister was uh, a lot smarter than me, but I still did all right in school and everybody's teachers except for me. So uh, both my parents were, they're retired now, but both my parents were teachers and my sister's a teacher as well. I was in the mix a little bit but never really part of the team with the U-17s and the U-20s until uh, my sophomore year in college uh, was when I started playing with the, the U-23 national team. and was on that team for a couple years leading up to Olympic qualifying. I was in the January uh, national team camp in 2009 and we played uh, Sweden. Uh, that's my only camp. It's uh, a little bit different from, I guess, uh, earlier in my career, but uh, I enjoy it and I'm, I'm just happy to, to still be playing. I, I love the game and I feel like I'll be involved in some aspect of the sport for the rest of my life, but at this point I'm still focused on playing and hopefully that'll last for uh, at least a few more years. Once in a while I do, yeah, obviously during the games you're, you're, you're focused and uh, kind of what's, what's going on, but especially in practice once in a while after, after practice to we'll see these guys taking free kicks and uh, I feel like I have to pay admission uh, just to watch them. It's, uh, they're some of the all-time greats and uh, they've been um, just a, a pleasure to, to play with and uh, they're not only great players but they're, they're great guys and it, it's, it's been really exciting for me and the other guys to have a chance to play with them.
I think the key is to try to play as much as you can without getting burnt out. If you can get in a lot of good soccer environments, that's only going to help you. Uh, and the more you play, the better. But you still have to find a balance there. I played a million different sports growing up, and I think in a way that definitely helped me. And it's kind of always uh, a balancing act with, with trying to find how much I could train and push myself without um, kind of going overboard and making sure that it was still enjoyable. I started in Mineola, played for uh, for Albertson, I played uh, New High Park, I played Dix Hills a little bit older, so I grew up playing uh, all over Long Island, obviously, and then playing for the, uh, for the ODP program and the state team and regional team and the national pool. So this is uh, this is home, this is my community, and this is where I grew up playing. I think the key is having a good support system, too. My, my parents always supported me. Obviously, it's a big commitment to be traveling uh, you know, around not only the country, but the world at a young age. And, and uh, to have that is very, very important. Like I said, a good structure, a good, uh, I think ODP at the time was, uh, is, was so important to me too, playing with the best players in, in the area and, and trying out for, for the national team. So that's a big part of it. So for me, it's having the right people around you, the right coaches and, and having a good support system. And that's kind of what led me to I guess to having the right mentality, the right attitude. Obviously, to be a pro, it's uh, you, you know so many things have to go your way. Not only be good, but also um, you know you go through ups and downs, and, and, and I think that support system is what has helped me through it. I'm very proud. I'm honored. It's humbling. Uh, I realize what the this team means to not just uh, I think soccer here in, in New York, um, the history behind it, but also help help put soccer on the map um, in, in you know in the U.S. So. For me to, to now be playing for this club, uh, a club that when my parents came from Portugal started watching and uh, some of the best names in the world, the greatest names in the world, um, playing for this team and now to represent them, to be the first player signed, to be the captain, it's, uh, you know, it really is humbling. So like I said, I'm proud. It's, it, to, to me, it's credit to the people that helped me get to this point, my coaches and, and my family, and that, that's a huge part of it. No words can describe, honestly. Uh, 2015 has been an unbelievable year for me. I mean, personally, and then obviously winning the championship with the team. But to be able to, to grab the number one you know, spot overall, and it came down to the last game, which was exciting, and then to, to have that in front of our family and friends. I mean, I had probably a couple of 100 people come out to watch, and, and like I said, I'm so lucky to, to have that support system. So for me, to, to be able to represent the club, especially this year, I think 2013 was a half a season, so it was, you know, everything seemed quicker, but this year fighting from the start and playing the whole year, and like I said, uh, having the home field advantage was, was incredible. So to win it, to have my son up on stage with me that, you know, obviously too young right now, but one day he'll look back hopefully and be proud and, and enjoy that, and that's, that's what it's all about. So it's kind of, sometimes I still have to pinch myself. The, to the players I've played with, I've, I've been so fortunate to have, you know, not just here, but of course through my career, played with some of the best players that have played the game and, and learn from them and, and take those experiences hopefully to, in the future. If, you know, I'd love to be a part of the game coaching or somehow, and, and uh, I'll take all those things, but to be the captain of some of the, the greatest players in the world, of course, for me, it's just trying to lead by example and, and, and learn. And they're true professionals. They won at the highest level. And I think, obviously, they were a very, very important part of our team this year. You know, I think the most important thing first is you have to love the game. You have to enjoy it every time you step on the field and not take anything for granted. That's uh, that's very, very important. If you're not, if you don't love it, if you're not working hard, I think uh, it's very difficult to get to the next level. Whether it's you know you want to play in, in, in high school and college or then play at the professional level. So for me, it's enjoying it. Um, you know, I think not getting too high when, when things go well and not getting too low when, when there's difficult times because we all go through periods of, you know, some challenges. And for me, it's kind of staying humble and, and working hard and, you know, 
not not being too arrogant about anything or not getting too hard on yourself. That's very, very important because that, that, that confidence and those little things are, are the difference between a, a, a professional player and, a, and a, someone who will play at a, at a lower level. So for me, it's, you know, enjoy the game, have fun, work hard, and, and also, you know, every day, I mean, I, I play with Raul and Marco Senna, even at their age, improving their game and training the right way, and that's, that's very important for the younger kids. I was about four or five years old when I started playing soccer on, on Staten Island. And uh, on Staten Island, it's, it's pretty much a church league, so I, I started playing for St. Clair's. Um, and uh, started in, in an indoor league, and uh, my mom still tells the story to this day. They were asking about the, uh, the little midget on the field that was clearly older than everybody else because I was running rampant on the field. So, uh, yeah, that's where it started in indoor soccer and then, you know, moved on from there. I stayed with St. Clair's for a few years and then moved up to Civil League Soccer Club, which was, uh, you know, travel soccer. I probably started at nine or ten years old. And then, uh, you know, through that, Civil League played in the Cosmopolitan League, so played with a bunch of Cosmopolitan select teams through the years and different tournaments with that. Uh, had a couple of stints with, with ODP and played some uh, Take care two years guys. with the state team. Um, and, uh, you know, that pretty much led me to college. There's a lot of factors to take take into account. Um, one of the things that was unique about my college decision was, uh, you know, MLS wasn't quite around yet, and uh, you know, I was making the decision based on what I thought my, the rest of my life would look like, and uh, you know, I didn't quite see professional soccer in that. So, academics was a huge uh, part of it, and you know, it, through the process, it actually ended up becoming pretty simple in that I wasn't highly recruited by a lot of different colleges. I was recruited by about maybe three. And uh, Fordham University happened to be a great academic institution with a good school that, um, with a good soccer program that really wanted me there, and uh, you know it kind of made its own decision in, in a way. Playing time is always determined by a bunch of different things. You know, I, at, going into college, I probably considered myself a, a very technical player and a player that liked to be on the ball and make plays and be creative. And uh, what I learned right away was that it was uh, a lot more physical than I thought it was going to be, and it was a lot more difficult. Um, to get time, I wasn't just a start. Given a starting job, I had to fight for it, and uh, you know I learned that lesson hard, but fairly quickly. And uh, you know I think one of the things that I learned right away was that uh, not living in my parents' house anymore and having them drive me to practice all the time. That I had to de determine my own uh, future and and learn to you know trust my instincts and you know feed off my passion for the game. And, um, you know, I learned that pretty quickly in my freshman year, and by the end of the year, I ended up being a starter and far away and getting more playing time. And um, you know, I learned that I, what the biggest thing that I learned is that I really wanted to play this game and that I really enjoyed it and was going to do anything, scratch claw, or whatever, to to keep playing and, and do more. I'm not sure it was a moment; it was more of a stage in my life, and uh, you know, some of the, the independence of leaving home, um, the challenges of being on your own, and, and kind of determining your own your own fate uh, were things that drove me and, and those questions, those challenges were answered by the fact that I, I just love playing. Um, I found out that I, I was, you know, I, I think I always enjoyed the game, it's not like I just learned that, but it, it just became something that was more mine, um, you know, more self-determined, and, uh, you know, that, that competitive fire just was always there, but just kind of got lit by the fact that I, I was um, more responsible for my, myself. And, uh, you know, it drove me to be, I was always competitive, but then it just drove me to be more competitive. And then MLS came along in my sophomore year, and I was, you know, I saw something in the future that I really wanted. And, you know, when, when those two things kind of met, uh, I think there was, there was something there. And I, you know, I didn't have it easy to do in my early professional days leaving Fordham and, you know, had to fight my way through. But, you know, my experiences at Fordham definitely taught me how to fight. And that, um, you know, driven by my passion for the game and com competition, you know, that mix, that whole ball, you know, really you know, pushed me forward to, in my professional career. I kind of always saw it that way, you know. Um, don't get me wrong, I had talent and there were certain things that I had, certain, certain skill sets. And, uh, you know, learning those skill sets and knowing my strengths and working on my weaknesses was a big thing for sure. But if you're asking for one thing, it's, it's definitely that, that passion and that desire for competition. Um, you know, I think... I must have said a thousand times to, to reporters and whatever that, you know, I was just there to get better every day. And whether it was practice, game, or whatever, my goal was to, to fight as hard as I could to, to get better each and every day. And, uh, you know, as long as I'm getting better, I'm going to get more playing time and I'm going to get more opportunities. And, and the guys that are chasing me are, are going to be a little bit further behind me. So that's the way I looked at it. If I'm talking to the parents, you know, I, I have to thank my parents for, for all that they, they did for me. I mean, my, 
my mom and my dad drove all over the place while I was a kid, so you certainly have to be there in a support role. Uh, but always remember that the, your child is the one that's going to determine how far they go. And, uh, you know, it's more about how much they want it than how much you want it as a parent. And, uh, you know, as much as you can and as hard as it might be is, you know, to take a step back and let them be as independent as possible. Because I know in my experience that my parents were all over the place and they were so supportive of me and did everything. Um, but I didn't really blossom until they kind of took a step back and let me be myself. And, you know, maybe that mechanism of going away to college was, was the reason for that. But I, I feel like, you know, they certainly prepared me and gave me all those great lessons about loyalty and dedication and commitment and all that. Um, but at the end of the day, it, it was, you know, my, my own choice and my own passion that really drove me forward and made the difference. I had to unique pleasure of playing the sport literally since I was 10 years old. Uh, grew up in Long Island Junior, played for uh, Mr. Peter Collins, who was the former president. Our team went to the national finals at U19. We were the first team from Long Island to uh, get there. Um, I had uh, the uh, pleasure of playing at Adelphi University for Bob Montgomery. I happened to be very fortunate to get a full scholarship and, and uh, attended there and was a four-year starter. Uh, so I enjoyed a uh, pretty good playing career. Some of the changes I've seen over the last 15, 20 years is in uh, two areas. The level of the volunteer has clearly changed and the level of experience of that volunteer has, has dwindled and that this has become a, a very, very scarce commodity. So when I played club ball and even 20 years ago, the volunteer was the backbone of the team. But over the last five or six years now, it's become uh, a trainer-based uh, environment because the uh, uh, volunteer uh, base just wasn't uh, experienced enough to try to take the players to the next level. And that's become a uh, uh, clearly a much more costly endeavor for the players. Clearly what the biggest change is, that top 2% now, almost all of them, you have a trainer-based program in place. The hardest thing that parents and players, as they get older, to understand is the scholarship money available clearly goes after the top half percent. They, they don't really fully understand that unless that player, and I use the, the phrase, um, um, glows in the dark, makes it very, very hard. And the player that just falls below that cut sometimes feel like they belong in that glow-in-the-dark category. And that's where they're starting to change. To me, a glow-in-the-dark player is this player, when you watch him or her play, they absolutely dominate the game at 12, 13, 14, 15. And someone who has a good soccer background, and a trainer will tell you, someone who's been around the sport, that player stands out, all right? And you just, you just can't miss and say, he is clearly the best player on the field, male or female. And at Smithtown, we've had the, we've had the, the good fortune of seeing that a player come through. Every four or five years, we managed to develop a player that what I would define glows in the dark. Unfortunately, with the paid-to-train environment, sometimes parents get led to believe that, you know what, uh, if I go to this environment, it's going to enhance my chance. Some players and parents feel like they still have that opportunity and they may not be as candid with themselves on, on uh, recognizing that opportunity. Again, I never like to rain on anybody's uh, parade in terms of what they want to be opportunity, but you also want to be somewhat realistic. You know, you know, and I see it in other sports where they really push it even more, not just in soccer. And for us, at least how we manage it within our club and with our, our trainers is, it's the overall experience and that elite player or that very, very good player should use the sport and the investment to try to get them in the school that they want to go to and then if they could complement it by playing the sport, they can. It's very hard for a parent to be that, that objective. Always very, very difficult. And the other element that's very, very different as well is all these college coaches now have a huge pool to pull from. So it's not just Long Island. So what we see and what I see and now seeing it for the last three or four years as, as, as we've had the, 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 the 
the unique opportunity of producing some high-level teams, both in the boys and the girls, I got to see how they are all able to participate and get, get some access to the scholarship money. But the fierce competitiveness of it is because there's so many kids out there that play such good soccer that you just have to be a lot more realistic, you know, uh, on it, uh, on that one. So, especially that what I would define the the three to five to ten percent range, where it's it's a little 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 less realistic for them. But the sport still could give them a, a great ability to get into a in, get into a college and participate uh, at that level because it's it's such an enriching sport to be able to do. The Arsenal, and again, they were a glow-in-the-dark team as opposed to a glow-in-the-dark player. So they really had a great foundation, which was very rare, and we caught lightning in the bottle as a club where you had six, seven kids from Smithtown, up to ten, be able to compete at a, on a national stage versus these clubs across the country where they're pulling from a hundred miles, and Smithtown was pulling from a five-mile radius. So the the good portion of those players were did get excellent exposure and they got into the schools that they wanted to get into. Did some of them get scholarship money? Yes. Did any of them get full scholarships? Only the glow in the dark ones got the full scholarships. The rest of them out of a roster of 22 got different portions um, all, all over the place. And on our girls side, girls is a little different on the soccer side. It's a little more narrow of a base. So we had more success with putting some girls you know, that got half scholarships, quarter scholarships, and they, more importantly, they got into the schools that they uh, really wanted to get into and then allowed them to be able to uh, have an education first and then enjoy playing soccer at the college that they did. That starts 14, 15, maybe 13 a little bit. But at, at from U9 all the way up to U13, it, it, it's irrelevant. They could be superstars and at 10 or 11, 13 or 14 is where they start to, the player, the girl or boy, starts to understand how good they want to be. And then the second element of that is, if they truly want to be that good, and it's, the, it's an extreme rare rarity these days, how much they take it upon themselves to play the game and how much they watch. You know, too many times I hear that because they're paying a trainer twice a week, which is only three hours a week, and then a game, which everybody knows they touch the ball between three to five percent, that they're going to turn into glow-in-the-dark players from nine to fourteen. It's not happening, Kevin. They got to be watching the game every week, three to four hours watching the game, and they got to play on their own. All right. So from that development and the the training program when it's in when it's in place properly and the training program which we're proud of at Smithtown is focused on developing from 9 to 14 and we take we take winning as a secondary because how else do you justify how else do you um, measure success we're fortunate in our club that the training program we have with Tom Lips and his organization is from 9 to 13 they do nothing but focus on developing player development the board and the club really feel winning is secondary. There's plenty of competition right on Long Island. So from 9 to 13, there's really no need to play in any other league except Long Island Junior because there's good enough competition. And since we're developing, you're not having to go play for some of these clubs where they're already traveling at 10 and spending thousands of dollars a year going traveling overnight to all these tournaments and all, and all, over, the, all over the Northeast. As they get older, then you just be a little more selective of what tournaments you go to. Then at that point, you know, to be able to save, to be able to save, save some of your money on that one. So that's that's kind of the way I, I would approach it because it, it's a difficult thing to tell a parent not to invest in their child. And the other element is uh, keep the teams playing in one league. You know, that's more of a function of the club. So as a parent, you want to look at where they're doing. If they're playing in two leagues, what's the point? What's the objective? If you so that just means more money for the trainer if they're playing in two leagues. So you, you you evaluate the program and say you know what, forget what league it is, whatever they think is going to give them the best opportunity for their develop. You pick the league, you know, as opposed to going with a team that's playing in two or sometimes three leagues. Hi, I'm Kevin McCrudden. I'm an international author and speaker and the narrator and producer of this segment for Eastern New York Youth Soccer Association. So now you've seen a lot of information from some of the most amazing athletes and players that have ever come from the New York area, as well as some of the best coaches in New York. 
and their advice is pretty consistent. It's about guiding our children and being there to support them and making sure that we help them develop the motivation and the drive to be successful players as well as successful human beings. Remember, one of the most important things that we can do for our children is provide them with love, unconditional love. Because as parents, that is the most important thing that we can do. Not help them get college scholarships, but to help them flourish as human beings. And also remember that Michael Jordan, one of the most important things in his life is he was cut from his eighth grade basketball team. It was a defining moment in his life that helped catapult him to become one of the greatest basketball players and one of the greatest athletes ever in history. That one incident of him being cut was the thing that motivated him. So as we try to protect our children from being cut or having other things like that happen to them, it may be the very thing they need in order to grow as people and to become even more successful as athletes and as human beings. So this entire film and production has been guidance and direction to you as parents. And I know it's a very difficult time and we want to do so much to help motivate and inspire our kids and present the best opportunities for them to be successful. But as you've heard from some of the greatest players we have, that isn't always the best way to do it. In my book, Who Are You?, where I talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it's about what does the child need in order to help them grow. Each of your kids is different. Each one of them needs different pushes, support. But one thing that every child needs is love. And as parents, that is our greatest responsibility, is to love our children unconditionally. But that doesn't mean that we should interfere with the success of their soccer careers by telling them that the coach is wrong. Most coaches will put the best players on the field. They don't want to lose. They want their best players to be on the field. And if your child is not one of those players that's on the field consistently, then potentially the, the coach does not see them as being one of his best players or her best players. It's between the coach and the child where the child starts to learn how to be self-motivated for them to understand how to become their very best. Do they need to work harder at practice? Do they need to increase their level of skill? Do they need to have more desire in order to be successful soccer players, which will help make them better human beings when they're older? And one of the founding principles of soccer in Long Island and New York is a quote from Rocco Amoroso, is building character through soccer. In the end, that's what we're doing. It would be wonderful if our kids play in the World Cup team or in Major League Soccer or in the NWSL. But in the end, we're building human beings and not soccer players. Once again, this is Kevin McCrudden from Eastern New York Youth Soccer Association. I hope that you've enjoyed these clips and this information that we've provided you. And I hope that it helps you guide your child through their soccer career. Once again, helping them to become the very best that they can be. Take care and good luck.